All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. Welcome to another episode of the How We Solve show. And today we have my friend Chala Dinkoy on the show. And Chala is the CEO of Rep the Repositioning Expert. And Chala helps people to position your business. And positioning your business is a really tough thing. Um, I've been struggling with this my entire entrepreneurial career and with all the uh, different business where I'm involved in currently in, in my portfolio. All the, my business partners, they also struggle with it because it's a really tough thing to say, okay, I'm only focusing on these specific customers and, you know, every, my whole marketing, everything's just geared towards them because you feel like you're losing out on all the rest and um, Chala will help us with this and Chala will take my positioning on um, a few of my brands and will destroy it and then build it, put it, put it back together. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love how you put that. It's not as scary as it sounds, people. <laughs> and by the way, if, if you're if you're um, ballsy enough and you want to come on the show, like in 20 minutes <laughs> or so, and you, you want that Chala rips you apart and builds you back back together again, you know, just le leave a comment and we, we can do this as well. David, you're so funny. We're going to be, and by the way, this is what I do all day, every day. I mean, I have a, a huge event that I'll talk about uh, in just two days where I'll be allegedly ripping people apart, which we like to look at as repositioning. It's gentle. Repositioning. David, I have a book called Gentle Marketing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, actually, I, I didn't do your, um, you know, your, do the proper intro and um, if you want to give us a little brief background on all the stuff that, that you're doing. Yes, yes, yes. So for 18 years, I said no thank you to people who are trying to sell to me because I worked at corporate. David, you never worked at corporate, right? No, I escaped it. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. You're like a smart cookie. Um, I worked for Pepsi, Pizza Hut, Frito-Lay, these big sexy brands and tons of people tried to pitch us like nonstop pitch, 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 pitch. And, you know, I kept saying no, and it's not because I'm not nice, because, you know, I always say I'm Canadian, we're nice, I'm Canadian Turkish, so we're double nice. Double nice. But, uh, <laughs> double nice, yeah, I mean, Turkish people are so nice. And um, the reason was because they're not differentiated, none of these vendors are differentiated, they don't stand out for anything, they're only talking about price and service and longevity and, uh, you know, years in service. Uh, it just meant nothing to us. And so we just kept saying no, no, no. And so about nine years ago, I started my own business and I decided I'm going to teach these people what to say and how to position themselves so that they can actually get into a buyer's meeting with these large corporations. And then I um, did something called super niching, which is like really, really, really getting very clear on a very small subset of the market, which is what I talk about and I teach all the time. So I super niched in um, diverse businesses because they have matchmaking orgies of thousands of people pre-COVID and now they have them virtually. And so I taught those people how to uh, introduce themselves and I became an elevator pitch coach so that they could, within a couple of, uh, you know, within a minute, they could have the buyer saying, I need to talk to you. And that's what my specialty became. And that's what I do now. And I'm hired at conferences and I have events where people just line up, they put their hand up and I just, as you put it, tear into destroy them, them. <laughs> destroy them. And then, uh, and they're so happy to be destroyed. They're like volunteering to be destroyed. And then they hire me after they're so happy. So, I mean, it, it's a whole uh, new way of looking at your elevator pitch and your messaging is that it's not about what you do. It's a hook. Like, stop talking about what you do for the love of God. It's just a hook. People buy not what you do, they buy why you do it, I guess. Simon Sinek thing. Is there something that goes into it? <laughs> yeah. Well, the sad part is, unfortunately, people buy their pain. They only care about themselves. They really don't. They, it's secondary that they care about your story. They remember your story, but they really purchase, 70% purchase based on their pain, their problem. If there's no problem, I always say no pain, no sale. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's maybe start with the elevator pitch because I guess that's like a big part of positioning. If you have your elevator pitch down, yeah. you know, this kind of is 80% of the rent in terms of getting your positioning right. Well, the elevator pitch is just the 
lipstick on the pig, right? It's it's just the tip of it's just the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg is the positioning, and the tip is of the iceberg is the part you can see. So the elevator pitch is the first opening of how you can see the tip because if you you have no strategy or it's a hot mess, your elevator pitch reflects that. I can tell. Like you know, I have a podcast called Polish My Pitch where I tear people down. So it's five minutes. It's only five minutes. And in five minutes, in 30 seconds, I can tell whether you're leaving money on the table or not. And, you know, have you read um, Malcolm Gladwell's, um, is it Blink? I don't know. Point? Blinkus? No, Blink. There's, there's, yeah, there's one called Blink. And I think it's in that book. He talks about a psychologist who's done so much research on um, marital communication and he can predict to, uh, if they are going to divorce or not. Mm-hmm. And so he like finds himself in uh, the mall in food courts overhearing conversations and he could between, you know, couples and he could predict if they're going to divorce or not, you know? <laughs> and so crazy. I, I, that's how I feel. Not I can't predict if you're going to th- get divorced, David, but what I can predict is whether you're leaving money on the table or not once I hear your elevator pitch. So I always liken myself to that guy. So how about you give us your elevator pitch? So let me tell you, this. three out of four business owners never get asked for their information or their business card or a meeting after they introduce themselves to their prospect. What I do is I fix what they're saying so that every hello turns into a request for a meeting. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Is it clear what I do? Yes, it is. <laughs> Good. I hope so. <laughs> All right. So do, do you want to take a hack at it? I mean, you've got so many businesses. Which one would you go with? Um, let's start with... Actually, let me see if GQ, my business partner, GQ, he runs LTV+. Plus. Uh, we provide live chat agents and support agents mm. to SaaS and e-com businesses. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, let, let, let's bring him on. One thing that maybe could help me with, with how we solve, because how we solve, you know, I have these different businesses and my idea was to have how we solve, which is the umbrella where they're all under. And, you know, we create content that is relevant for our target audience, which is SaaS and e businesses. Mm-hmm. And yeah, maybe we, we could work on the positioning of how we solve on, on what we do. So okay. target audience. And also in terms of maybe we break it down with the with the different steps that we need for for positioning. So I guess it's like okay. So he, yeah. So sorry, sorry to cut you off. Here's the formula: the who. So who you help, you already said. Plus, and you can write this down if you want. This is the formula. It's like the simplest thing: the who you help plus the problem that you solve. The, and it has to be the most expensive, hairy, juicy problem that you solve for that target and how you do it and what the result is. And that's it. So there's four components, the who, the problem, how you solve it, and then the result. So for example, in mine, it was the who was business owners. The problem was they never get asked for a business card after they present themselves. And then how I help is I fix what they're saying. And the result is every hello turns into a sale, a, a sales meeting. So in your case, the who is SaaS companies, right? SaaS and e-commerce companies, yes, which okay. can be also be a problem because it's two different. Do they have associations together? Do they have events together? Do you know what I mean? Do they have different organizations or do they have different LinkedIn groups? Or Yeah, yeah, because a lot of SaaS businesses are also focusing on the e-com space, you know, so I guess it's, there's some overlap there. So it, the way that I decide you know, how to pick a target is based on industry or interest group. If if one of these industries is big enough, has their own associations, organizations, LinkedIn groups, meetings, trade shows, conferences, uh, journals, periodicals, then let's just pick that one. But if they're, if they have like minimum 70% overlap, then let's pick both. I'm okay with that. But I would much rather that, you know, in your elevator pitch, one, that you're talking directly to them and two, that you use their language and three, that your marketing plan places you constantly seven to 12 touches and in their world talking about them. 
And that's the key word in their mind is it goes, oh my God, this person's talking about me. They hear their own industry. Does that make sense? Yes, this makes sense. So maybe we can even go broader and say startups, because it's kind of always startups that, that we that we work with mainly. It's never like a large corporation or corporate, etc. It's always tech startups and e-commerce startups. Okay. So we could say the who is startup founders and, and executives. And but it's tech startup, right? I'd say so, yeah. And then that the tech startups actually have their own networks their own yeah absolutely event. conferences yes 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 Perfect. okay so that was it so the target is tech startups what is the most expensive problem you solve for them we help them scale faster and you know kind of like like you bring industry experts on that have solved hard problems already and we kind of give them the blueprint on how to solve these problems that are holding them back in their business okay so let's make up a statistic that you can then look up uh, I always like to sharpen the elevator pitch with a stat, just like how I said, three out of four business owners. And it could be anecdotal or it could be an actual uh, stat that you find. But what is, um, well, first of all, what is the consequence of not scaling faster? Do they run out of money? Yes. I mean, you could maybe take the statistic of like how many startups fail, you know, okay. like, uh, like so and I, I don't know if off the top of my mind, but I guess like, you know, in terms of not, I don't know about startups, but I think in terms of business, I think uh, eight out of 10 businesses fail in the first five years or something like this. Yeah, there is something like that. But I, I want to get more specific because I would like there to be like you could do that, you, but it's it's kind of too generic and too many people are already saying that and it's too broad. So what I'd like to mm -hmm. do is tighten it so that like they, they're like hit in the head with this scary statistic, which is only about them. So, uh, and then it gives them a picture of pain in the future. So uh, talk to me about how many tech startups, first of all, if they, they, they run out of, they burn through their cash. Funding, right? they're, yeah. They're exactly, they're, they burn through their funding. How much does that happen? And then they never get back in the game or how many burn through their funding at launch? I can't, I can't give you any okay. statistics I'm on just that, saying but... like, I bet you a lot of them do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so one, you'll have to find that out. And two, uh, you could talk to your own networks and talk to 10 uh, tech founders and say, how many times have you this happened or how many times has this happened to you? And then you could anecdotally say, based on you know my conversations with my network, eight out of 10 uh, new tech startups run out of funding before getting to profitability. Mm -hmm. What we do is blah, blah, blah. We match them up with um, topic experts to make sure that that, to make sure to solve their most immediate urgent problems so that they get to profitability within the next six months, whatever the result is. Um, mm -hmm. I would love it if you could even sharpen it further by saying something like, um, uh, what you do, like, what is the most number one reason why they run out of uh, runway? Like, what's the number one reason why they can't scale faster? You know how all the experts that you bring, what is the number one topic of expertise that they are in need of? One thing that comes to mind is like, if somebody has been there and done that, you know, like somebody who like had a business, had a successful exit and starts again, that these people are more likely to succeed because they'll make the mistakes that, you know, that you kind of, you know, you've, you, you've been there and done that. And, um, you know, kind of like, I don't know, a Sherpa who went up the Mount Everest a few times, they, you know, they can guide you. And, um, so you just don't make the unnecessary mistakes, you know, like learn from the mistakes that others have, have done already. Yeah, but what is the number one mistake that's being made by tech startup founders that's stopping them from scaling faster that you find yourself having to help with mo more often, most often? I think it's so it's pretty broad. You know, like you can hire the wrong people, you can pick the wrong strategy, you can pick the wrong industry, you cannot have your positioning right. You know, there's like a million things that you know kind of are in this field. So it's so. Um, if we were working together, if you were my client, 
what we would do is that that is the piece that we would explore is in the minds of tech startup founders, what is the number one uh, danger for them that they foresee as the obstacle to scaling? What is the number one thing that they see? And then if they foresee a problem in either the hiring or the strategy or positioning, then you can actually develop your solution around and, and, and label it and brand it around that. So for example, you you know that there's a the staples button, right? The easy button. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Easy, yeah. I don't even yes, yeah. have that in Turkey, but <laughs> I <just laughs> they have staples in Turkey. But if if you know, there's no actual human that goes and runs out and gets your stuff when you press that button. They actually sell that button. It's hilarious. But it's a it's a a, a branding gimmick around the process mm -hmm. that people will remember. So then for example, let's say the number one problem that you solve would become um, strategy or hiring. Then you could have the quick scale scale up um, hiring process. So, so then your elevator pitch then becomes so very niched into we help tech startup founders uh, reduce the uh, fail rates or what was it? Uh, reduce running out of cash before the six month mark by helping them with the quick hiring method or the quick hiring mm. act or whatever whatever the problem is that you would then develop a branded solution to that and that would be your elevator pitch then that's your hook once you get in through that top of the mountain then you can cross sell them everything around strategy and marketing and whatever else problem they have but does that make sense Yes, this makes all sense. And the problem with how we solve it is like it's kind of abstract because I'm just forming this right now in terms of the, the umbrella. But let's pick something concrete and maybe I get um, GQ, my business partner, in who runs LTV Plus. Mm -hmm. And then we have like a more concrete mm -hmm. business and some actually more stats. And, you know, we know the pain points better. It's like cl more clearly defined. Mm -hmm. So let's show them this link over. And, huh. But yeah, let's. Um, I'll, I'll ping you after the show because I'd like to drill into this a little further. And I'll, I'll do my <laughs> okay. homework to, to, to kind of do your homework. That's right. But I mean, uh, so does it make sense how it makes total sense? Yeah, total. Go to the top of the mountain and then just pique their interest. And if that's what they're going to bed with every night, that problem, then you've got them. And you, you can't know that until we do the market research and we go and talk to it. A number of them, even if it's just exploratory, it's never going to be quali quantitative. It's always going to be qual qualitative because, you know, when I worked for Pepsi, you had to do um, research that was in, in enough numbers to represent the population that could be extrapolated to the population. But obviously we're small businesses. So I've created a version of that research, but for us that we can do in two weeks and yeah, for free. Oh. <laughs> I will ping you about this. So I just oh, found GQ. Hey, GQ, up? please meet Chala. Chala, please meet GQ. Hey, uh, Which part of the world are you in, GQ? I'm currently in Kiev, in Ukraine. Got to be here for another two weeks before we head back to Singapore. I have a little guest star. Oh, my us God. As well. oh, <laughs> so, yeah. He's so cute. Oh, <laughs> Thank I'd you. rather do. Hi, let's polish your pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I want food. I want mommy. Okay, exactly. <laughs> he, he wants mommy. Mommy's not around, so yeah. Oh, I, I no. <laughs> oh that's wonderful. Wow. Good for yeah. him. He's a globe trotter. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. He's gonna he's gonna see a lot while he's young. But but yeah, super glad to be catching up with you, Chala. Yeah, I, I was actually just catching a little bit of uh, a bit of the stream just before I joined. Uh huh. Yeah. Ah. So. The idea is that we take apart LTV Plus's positioning and, um, yeah, get, get Charles input from this. So, so GQ, how uh, do you normally introduce yourself to a prospect like the company? How do you, when they say, what is it that you do? What is it that you say to them? Sure. Sure. So I introduce myself as GQ, the co-founder of LTV Plus. And at LTV Plus, we increase the customer lifetime value of all the businesses minus this guy. And uh, what I share as well is that uh, the main two things that we focus on with clients are <laughs> increasing sales and reducing churn. Uh, and we do this through omnichannel customer service, 
Phil came in recovery <laughs> and Karna Venom in recovery. So those are the three things that I bring up. Um, but the key things that I always bring up are increasing sales and reducing churn. Um, uh -huh. So right now we're mainly focused on e-commerce, but we do have SaaS businesses that we work with as well. Okay, gotcha. All right. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty much what uh, David and I were talking about. Um, whichever one you want to focus on, unless there's an en enormous lap overlap with the SaaS and e-commerce, I would just pick the one unless there's like, as you say, there's such a huge overlap. And then um, the first um, attention is as soon as you open your mouth. So I really don't want people to, to waste that with talking about their name <laughs> and the name of the company. <laughs> I know it's okay, okay. terrible. Really cool. I know. I, I mean, I wrote a book uh, called um, uh, How to Make Anyone Like You in Seven Seconds or Less because Harvard Research says that it takes seven seconds for someone to form an impression of you whether you're capable or not, which is really scary. But in the first 30 seconds, you're, you're um, you know, they're mo more, most attuned to what you're going to say and then they uh, pick out of it if there's an, anything in it for them and then they glaze off, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, mostly, I'm not saying everybody, not everyone's a, you know, a rocket scientist, but so use that time as soon as you open your mouth to engage them. I always say with a question because when you ask a question, um, the human mind gets kicked out of their programming. So normally we're being just run on, you know, autopilot. And like right now you guys are in autopilot, just listening to me. But if I were to ask you a question, I would say, GQ, tell me how you introduce yourself. Then your creative mind wakes up. So when you're mm -hmm. asking someone a question, you immediately get them to pay more attention. So why not? get them to start paying more attention when you're introducing yourself. So then when you say, do you know, they're like, what, what? Somebody's trying to ask me something. I better listen. And then you're asking them, you're giving them a pain statistic about themselves. So in your case, um, I would start with, um, first of all, I would do the research to figure out what do they perceive as the number one problem? That's first of all, what is the biggest pain that they can foresee so like what david said is it the lack of you know running out of their funding is that their biggest fear is that what's keeping them up at night and then i would talk about that and then uh, relate what you do to how you reduce it so is it the sales churn or is it or is it the is, is the churn related to hiring you guys um, so this would be, yeah, this would be the filled payment piece. Actually, that gave me an idea, two, two ways that I can think about it. So would it be better if I let in the question that says, like, for example, did you know that having live chat on your site can increase your conversion rates by more than 10 times? Uh, yeah, for example, would that be a better way to be in as a question? Yeah, a, a question is the way to go, but I would love it if you asked the question, if you asked, the question is just a, a trick. Did you know? What you're really trying to do is say a statement and the statement okay. should be about their pain and the statement, sh if you can size it with the statistic and make it scary, then it makes you look believable, credible and an expert in their pain. And it should be the oh. statistic should always be about their pain. But okay. the pain you need to research to find out if it's relevant to m more than just one person. It has to be across the board and a generally agreed pain. You can't say... You can't educate people into a pain. You tr you can try, but it's more expensive and you'll lose a lot of people. They'll say, that's not my problem. And I'll give you an example. Is, is it over, overspending on their, on their ads? You know, like you overspend on your it ads is. because you're not, you're not um, capitalizing as much as you could from the traffic by integrating live chat agents and fast responses to your support tickets. You will increase your conversion rate by blah. You know, what I like about that, David, is it's way more specific than running out of uh, funding. But mm -hmm. I won. So th there's two ways we can go at it. We can go at that specific solution in the solution part, but we can still put up the big, hairy, you know, scary, ultimate consequence of not getting their ad spend right as running out of spend. So. The trick is to talk to the decision maker who's going to make the decision to hire you, the check signer. And 
to find out what that macro problem is in the in their back of their brain that keeps them from sleeping that big hairy expensive problem because maybe solving uh ad spend is not the biggest issue that they're worried about do you know what i mean i can give you two other big issues i guess like if if you have seasonality, for example, at the end of the year, you have like way more support tickets coming in because your e-commerce is just like selling way more. Kind of like the seasonality and, and these spikes, I think that's a really big pain point that they have. And then they have like too many tickets in the backlog and, you know, um, you know, making their customers unhappy and decreasing their lifetime value on customers. Okay, so I'm loving that way more than decreasing lifetime value. Because to me, that's too generic, like, but mm -hmm. it's so specific when you're talking to me and I'm in the, in the hell of trying to manage seasonality spikes and I'm losing money hand over fist daily, I'm going to listen to you rather than if I hear some canned, uh, um, generic messaging around, I, we increase lifetime value, like doesn't mm -hmm. say much, right? But if you get to the specifics then I'm listening to you. And especially if you put a statistic around it, then they'll be like, well, we're not the only loser. Everybody's stuck suffering from this. And my God, these guys are specialists in this. Make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can hear, I can hear. Thank the you. Gears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the baby's gone, GQ. Baby no, got he's bored. He's chewing on his panda, just like that. Oh. Just something else. <laughs> I'll, I'll be doing that after the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was, that was really interesting. Yeah, because there was like there are like uh, three main things. Like so, the seasonality part of that—that's a really good aspect. I think that we can share with our clients because that's a really big pain point of theirs. And I think the other piece that we also brought up, and this is more for subscriptions, we can say that. Uh, for example, like, uh, did you know that 50% of all churn is caused by filled payments? Or did, did you know that 50% of your churn is caused by filled payments? Like, so something like that, it's uh, like, because with the filled payment recovery piece, uh, we, we share that, you know, with a personalized approach, you're able to get at least more than 60 to 70% recovery rate, which is like no hanging fruit. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, if that's a pain point. The trick that I'm seeing for you guys is you're kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall. Like you don't have a strategic market knowledge that you've actually gone and done this research and talked to them and you've plotted out all the different entryways of different positionings. And that's what, that's the genius that I do, right? I, I mean, I'm not suggesting you can't do it on your own, but that's what people pay me for is that we just like how we're doing with you guys, we come up with a whole bunch of different positioning uh, po possibilities and statements mm -hmm. and pain points. And then we go and we actually talk to different industries and different um, you know, decision makers in those industries about which of the pain points that we've come up with are most expensive for them and relevant. And then we make a strategy and a messaging um, strategy around, well, which one are, is the one to pursue right now? Because right now, for example, we're in the pandemic. Maybe the pain points are going to change in a year for cer certain decision makers or certain industries. Um, maybe some of them are more, more relevant. And you, wouldn't, you won't know that. I mean, I've had clients who were shocked after 20 years of thinking they knew their clients in business and industry of people coming up with all sorts of things that they never even thought about. Um, I had a, uh, this is a B2C client, but they, they did divorces. They, they were a mediator for divorces. And guess if people, I mean, I hope none of you ever get divorced, but um, did, did people want a cheaper divorce, a faster divorce, or a less emotional divorce? They always thought- Probably they, a less emotional. They, they, yeah, that's what they thought. They, they thought, and that's why their, their name was like um, something like, uh, you know, happy endings or something like that. You know, it sounds terrible. It wasn't exactly that. It was a massage. But anyway, um, so it turned out after they did the research and they did it with every industry, like every industry. So first of all, it turned out that the number one uh, divorcing um, industry was uh, emergency workers. So paramedics, nurses, mm. firemen, right? Anybody with shift work. And then it, it also turned out that it, 
regardless of their income, they all wanted a cheaper divorce. So all I'm saying is, um, even in the B2B world, we are shocked by some of the results of when we do the survey. And so it really, that's what we need to do is to figure out strategically where is the hot spot of, and, and it informs all of everything. It's not just what you you know say to them on LinkedIn when you try to connect. It's also in your elevator pitch. It's on your website. It's on everything, right? Makes sense. Interesting. Is the baby that's, still there? That's, yeah, that's... That, that, that gives me a lot to think about, Chala. That's just super nice. Uh-oh. So, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cool, cool uh, um, I'd say play, play with uh, little Liam, and I'll I'll kick you out of the, the live stream. I'll continue with Chala. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for yeah, jumping on. Yeah, thanks so much for the time, Chala. I really appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Oh, thanks for the baby, baby viewing. I always enjoy <laughs> the baby <laughs> Don't you uh, love seeing babies, uh, David? I don't know. Are you baby crazy? Um, I I, I have aphantasia and no emotion, so no, I'm I'm not baby baby <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Actually, when when our daughter was born, it was uh, it, I think when she was like a year and a half, then I started really bonding with her when she was like kind of like more oh interacting God. with me. Oh my! You God. know, and now she's like totally total daddy's girl, and we hang out all the time. Oh. But it took took a while. Like in, in the baby phase, it was just like. No. <laughs> do something else there's a book in you man have you written a book david no oh my god well i can see one. at some point when when i have more time okay. I, I, I may when, do that. You, when you retire <laughs> when i retire which which will never happen 90 um <laughs> <laughs> let's dig in actually on, on positioning just something i want to share with you my other other business of mine is shortlist.io and we initially did um, backlink building for um, for companies, you know, like for, to help them with SEO. And then we just turned to like a general marketing agency and then okay. stuff didn't work anymore, you know. And uh, we had like a very clear positioning in the beginning, done for you, backlinks, right? This was, awesome. was it, worked, worked great. And then at some point our outreach didn't work anymore, leads were not coming in anymore and it just kind of really halted. And then we just like launched a new website and read it our positioning can check it out shortlist.io and just drop this here in the link and um i think we had from the outreach just didn't in february the outreach did not work anymore i think we had like one or two appointments booked you know which is like terrible and then we switched the positioning, and um, I think the next month was like 24 or 25 appointments booked. <laughs> <What> <laughs> so was it was like so what did you change it to? I mean, now now we're back to done for you backlinks, you know, and also, oh, okay. also focusing focusing on the um, on agencies, on other marketing agencies, because like it's yeah. very easy to just kind of have this as an add on service for for the, for the agencies, and this just worked work like a charm. You know? So getting positioned yeah, right is so 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 specific, right? Um, I have a few questions for you that I would like to run through. Um, yeah, shoot. So, um, how can you tell if your business has a good niche? Like, when do you know you have found it? It's exactly what you said. If you're getting appointments, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, okay, so if, if you're if you're if, visible, you're, if your outbound is, is is working, I guess. Well, it's if like, anything is working, if when you're, uh, you know, <laughs> people used to get give you your um, business card. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's true. But people used to get um, uh, referrals, right? And then the referral, like from from an aunt or a sister or something, right? Because I mean, and this usually used to happen with uh, coaches, and the referral would have absolutely no idea what the client did, and it was such a complete mismatch to what they did that they couldn't even help them. And then the client would be wondering, well, oh my God, how did I ever even get this referral? Don't these people know what I do? Uh-huh, they don't. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what it is, right? They're just trying to be kind. So those are some signs. Like if your family doesn't understand what you do, <laughs> that's a good sign <laughs> that you don't have a good positioning. Oh, I mean, my, my last business was a content delivery network, so very techie and like nobody ever knew what I was doing, you know, so. But well, you so could, again, from a pain perspective, you could say, you know how people... Yeah, we make websites load faster. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Makes sense. Um, how, how do you, what, what steps do you take to kind of really hyper niche down and find your, how you call it, the right super niche? So this is a really great um, segue into invitation to my Thursday mastermind because we're, we'll be going through step by step. I'll take you through the steps now, but for 90 minutes on uh, May 13th, this Thursday at noon Eastern, we're going to go through and it's at, and I'll give you the link. It's uh, repositioner.com slash lead gen. So go ahead and register. It's for free. Uh, so the first step is we blue sky all of the different industries and interest groups and uh, that we want to target or work with and we um, rate them and we rate them on whether we like them oh it's actually lead gen just lead gen oh is that what comes up when you yes what comes okay, up. great okay perfect great so yeah so first we just like back of the envelope gut check of do we like them for ourselves these industries do they make us like break out in a hive or um you know can they pay us and then oh can they pay us the amount of money we want and then do we have reach to these people to the decision makers so we rate them on a scale of one to ten and then some industries pop up uh, as being the highest score the next step is we go out and we talk to the five people in each industry and we take a guess we say is number is a b or c your most expensive problem of course, their problems will be mm -hmm. solved. And then they pick one or they give us another one. This is where the magic comes in. And then um, the client brings back the data. And then together, we co-create messaging, positioning, target, and a marketing plan. And then, you know, I work with them for six months. So I teach them, I handhold them in how to actually deliver some of those marketing um, events or marketing mix or marketing components together. So like I teach them how to do an executive round table. I teach them how to write it. I teach them how to invite it, fill it. And then I teach them how to deliver it and so on. So that's how we work. How, how, how do you charge people for, for your services? If you, Oh, it's for, you, you have like packages. Or? Yeah, I have two packages that they're both for six months and one is way more like Turkish mother in your face. And then the others way more laid back, <laughs> more like German mother in your face, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I posted the link um, in, um, in the chat. Thank so if you, yeah. if you want to sign up for the, yeah, absolutely. For the masterclass, we're going live on um, Thursday. So you've still got time. Cool. Um, I have a how to question for you. Oh, um, okay. The famous, yeah, so the famous how to <laughs> the famous how to question, <laughs> how we solve. Um, what are the top five mistakes that people do with their messaging? Oh boy, okay. So I love this one because it drives me nuts. Um, so <laughs> let me just, one. let me tell you a story first. Um, I had a a client and she had been clinically depressed for 10 years. Had you, have you known anyone personally who'd been clinically depressed? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I don't, yeah. I didn't know this. Maybe you know this, but there's something that happens to their teeth because of the medication that they take. Do you, are you familiar with this? No. So apparently this medication that they take for being depressed ruins their teeth. And not only that, mm -hmm. but because personal care goes out the window when you're clinically depressed you depressed yes. so she had no teeth left they were all like black right completely every single one of them and uh so she had a va business and she wasn't able to grow it like she was a virtual assistant but she couldn't do networking she couldn't do any of the things that she needed to do to market herself and i asked her you know why and she said you know i've never told this to another human being and i'm you know 50 but i'm so ashamed of this my teeth and I said, well, why don't you get it done? And she said, well, first of all, I'm too ashamed to go into a dentist and show. And then she said, uh, for, and I think it's going to cost so much because it's every tooth. And then she said, mm -hmm. it's because also it's every tooth. It's going to be an unimaginable pain because every tooth has to be replaced. So mm -hmm. then she, that, those thoughts just wouldn't go. The next day in my free neighborhood newspaper in Etobicoke here in Toronto, we get the Etobicoke Guardian. 
there was and it's the cheap like free newspaper there was an ad it's a small ad from a local dentist it was just a picture of the dentist so it was a lovely woman and it said pain so bad teeth so bad that you can't even imagine going into a dentist and it actually talked exactly it said every single thing that she said so this was brilliant it was everything and it hit on everything come in for a no uh you know um expense uh, no guarantee no nothing just come in we will just look at you we'll just give a free estimate and that first step can be so hard but we'll hold your hands for it like it was written for her from her language from her pain language and it was so specific on the other side of the page was another dentist local dentist and it had we do teeth whitening we're multilingual we do you know bridges we do this we do that we do children it was everything and there were so many images there were images of teeth there were images of people kissing there were images of you know the the yard it was so like uh, confusing and cluttered and it was just everywhere so that's one of the mistakes that people make is that they do not speak to a specific target in their messaging and in their marketing the second is it is not pain based their marketing is not pain based and 70% of humans purchase based on pain um the third is that it is it it's not um using images of pain or images like they're letting go of the opportunity to capture attention through using human images of pain they're using stock images of things and when i worked at pepsi when we did ad research we used to do ad uh, eye tracking even back then like we had like even back then we could do that and we could see hot spots of where people got we were spending more time on ads and it was on human pictures of human emotion always got higher likes higher purchase intent so um the the other things that they're doing wrong in their marketing is um they're not they're not really in the world of their target when they're doing the marketing so that's what the 7 to 12 touches is all about is you, it takes 7 to 12 touches before somebody buys you but you're not in their world because you're not constantly hitting them in their face because you're not in their industry and because people self gather by industries or interest groups and when you get into their world it's by industry or interest group so you know when they look around well they're reading about you they're seeing you they're listening to you it's cuz you're in their world so people aren't getting it right because they're not focusing their marketing in that world um and then lastly you know marketing's not working because it's not strategic like people are just literally throwing spaghetti against the wall cuz they're guessing at it i've met like so many entrepreneurs on my shows on my uh podcast that are telling me that they've taken years and years and years and all they do is test all they do is test and all like if i did that at my jobs i'd be fired we had to have, <laughs> right we had to have a a researched strategy and a marketing plan with a budget that we had to put forward and we had to sell enough of those products to meet you know some targets right. every year otherwise we'd lose our job so that's how that is the huge difference between marketing the big brands and entrepreneurs marketing interesting yeah, i've always been also rather like test stuff throw stuff against the wall see what sticks and then kind of focus hard on the one that stuck right <laughs> you're you're an entrepreneur you i mean i would have been fired if i did that hmm but, if i went to my boss at pepsi and said hey i but, think we should spend a million on testing this but what do you think about you know kind of like agile development and waterfall development agile development is kind of like you know like doing like very small sprints and like um versus like the waterfall piece of um you know kind of like specking everything out and building the entire application and then kind of rolling it out once you have built the entire big thing versus kind of like you know building small tests almost you know kind of like more yeah yeah so they spent their brains out these big companies spend their brains out in concept testing don't get me wrong but i think the disparity between the entrepreneurs and the big established brands is the difference in the amount of time and and uh dollars they spend in the concept testing 
That's what I've seen. I've had so many clients come to me with already launched products and services that are like dead. They didn't, they had no traction. They didn't have enough a buy-in. There, there was just no market demand, not enough market demand. And it's because they didn't spend enough time up front to develop it in terms of that testing. So I do believe in that agile um, model, but they, in the big companies, they do that before launch and they spend their brains out on before the launch and then they they do the big launch how far can you break the market research down like how many how many people do you have to talk to that are in your you know if you have like let's say 50 customers you talk to these 50 customers and they kind of tell you why they work with you or what the pain points that you kind of fix is this enough or like can't be 10 or does it have to so be 100 it, or? so to be honest with like we have to do uh, anecdotal. So we have to do 15 people. We do five people in each of the three industries. Some clients want to do more industries. So we talk to five more people. So it's five people in each industry. And we never talk to existing clients unless we mm. want to cross sell them a new service or product. Because talking to existing clients is about retention. <laughs> what we're trying to get is acquisition. So we're trying to talk to the market of the people that we that don't love us that don't work with us that don't already know us and have a perception around us so we try to talk to people that we know in some way because it can't be cold because they would never give us the, the time mm -hmm. to be able to talk about their pain they would never trust us with that kind of information but we uh, get in with the high level decision makers who are top you know decision makers who can actually either influence or check sign for us and then we ask them about the pain points. So, but as, uh, in my methodology, I recommend five of each. That gives us a really good direction. But is it scientific? No, because it, you know, when I worked, we had the money to make it scientific. We mm -hmm. would first do like three flights of 15 people of personal interviews, and then we would go and do quantitative testing with at least 100 and sample size of 150, which was then uh, statistically significant to the, you know, protracted to the population. But we, we don't have the money to do that as small businesses. But I'm happy enough if my clients get enormous information, but also they convert these conversations. There's a way that I teach them. To convert them into sales later on. I Actual guess, yeah. sales. You're in front of people who are in pain talking about the pain. Of course, they're going to ask you, can you help me? Yeah, let's definitely talk about this. I think this could be very beneficial for um, for LTV Plus because you know we have like multiple different services that we offer, and it would be kind of like cool to just like spearhead with one and just yeah. focus more. Yeah, it's a, it's the hook, right? Which is the bleeding hook that people are most looking for right now to get your foot in there and then blow their brains out with you know impressing them. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's let's do this. I'll I'll have to keep ping you, and <laughs> we'll, we'll drill into this. Well, I'll tell you, I've never had a baby on a podcast before, so this is a first for me. <laughs> True, I actually, really... same here. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, so Liam, GQ's baby, had his uh, first podcast appearance at like you know eight age one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> He's gonna you know be a how star. they say kids are born with iPhones now. This is a new <laughs> new height of uh, yeah technology for me. Do you know like how can you test if somebody is like a millennial or or not? If you oh, ask yeah, them like yeah. with with the phone, like you know how would you talk on the phone and like you know yeah. all the people do this yeah, yeah. and they do this. You know, so. <laughs> I do this all the time. It's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> We used to play with bananas when we were kids yeah. and pretend they were phones. Phones, yeah. <laughs> How things change. <laughs> well, awesome, Chala. Thank you very much for being on the show. I really enjoyed this. And um, do you have anything else you want to share with your audience? Something you want to pitch? By the way, everybody, uh, Chala's um, masterclass, Lead Gen masterclass, it's this Thursday. The link is posted. If you want to check this out, I think it's going to be awesome. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I have a book I want to give away. Um, it's uh, the e-copy e of my book, Gentle Marketing. So it's at repositioner.com slash uh, book. Mm -hmm. So, you know, go get a copy if you think any of this is relevant for your business. I talk about the gentle way. 
And it's really gentle because it's just so clear that people run after you. Awesome, Chala. Thank you very much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And yeah, let's let's talk soon and get get our position right. All right. Thanks for having me, David. Always such a pleasure. Thank you. Go shoes. <laughs> Take care. Go shoes.